April 11th, 2022, regular Wasilla City Council meeting is called to order. The time is 6 p.m. Before we begin, Council, please put away your cell phones. If you have personal business to attend to during the meeting, please move for a recess. If you are participating telephonically, please mute your phone unless speaking. Also, when speaking, please state your name for those streaming the meeting. As a reminder to all attendees, this meeting is being streamed live. The camera is located directly in the back of the council chambers, right above the clock. <laughs> Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Council Member Sullivan Leonard. Here. Council Member Graham. Here. Council Member Johnson. Here. Council Member Brown. Here. Council Member Vlock. Here. Council Member Rubio. Here. You do have a quorum, Madam Mayor. All members are present and participating in the council chambers. Uh, we do these. Would you please stand for Pledge of Allegiance and Councilman Brown, would you lead us? Yes, ma'am. Pledge of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. The first item of business is approval of the agenda. Are there changes to the agenda? Madam Mayor. Mr. Graham. I would like to move uh, item 8.2.2, ordinance serial number 22-11 to new business. Madam Mayor, if I may. Yes. Just to clarify with the council member, that is up for introduction. Still want to move it to new business? I do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, is there an objection to the agenda as amended? Madam Mayor, just a point of clarification. Was that 22-10 or 2211? 2211. Thank you. Okay. Correct, Council Member. 2211. Uh, the item regarding uh, police vehicles. Yes, yes. 22-11, yes ma'am. Yes. Okay. There is no objections. The agenda is approved as amended. We are now at special orders of the day. And I will read the mayoral proclamation recognizing national Telecommunications Week. City of Wasilla Proclamation recognizing National Telecommunicators Week, whereas an estimate 240 million calls are made to 911 in the United States each year, and public safety dispatchers are the first and most critical contact with emergency services, and whereas Emergencies can occur at any time that require police, fire, or emergency medical services. And whereas, when an emergency occurs, the prompt response of police officers, firefighters, and paramedics is critical to the protection of life and preservation of property. And whereas, the safety of our emergency medical service responders Police officers and firefighters are dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from the citizen who telephone the MATCOM Public Safety Dispatch Center. And whereas public safety dispatchers are the single vital link for our police officers and firefighters by monitoring their activities by radio, providing them information, and ensuring their safety. And whereas public safety dispatchers of MATCOM dis dispatch have contributed substantially to the apprehension of chemicals, suppression of fires, and treatment of patients and the public safety system 
simply would not work without them. And whereas each dispatcher has exhibited compassion, understanding, and professionalism in the performance of their job, working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 365 days a year. Now for I, Linda D. Ledford, Mayor of Wasilla, hereby proclaim April 10th, 2022 through April 16th, 2022 as National Telecommunicators Week in the city of Wasilla in honor of the men and women whose diligence and professionalism keep our city and citizens safe. And Jacob Butcher is our dispatch manager. So Jacob, if you'd come forward, please. It is with my greatest appreciation for what you and your employees do for the city and keeping all of us. It's not just the city, but it is borough wide, keeping us safe and uh, putting where we need to be. So thank you, Jacob. No speech. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, on, behalf of, on behalf of the people at our uh, dispatch center, it's an honor to have the city council take the step to recognize us uh, for the line of work that we do. Um, without your support, uh, it would be a much more difficult process. But over my years here, the mayor's office and the city council have done fantastic at supporting public safety all the way around, and I appreciate that. I thank you guys so much. We are now at Commission and Agencies Report. Planning Commission. We'll begin with uh, Public Works Director Bishop on the Planning Commission meeting. Do we have one? Crystal, are you taking that? I am. Uh, so the Planning Commission did meet and one of the uh, accomplishments is the approval of the new Midas facility uh, by Ginger Basil. Uh, they were able to uh, get their conditions and their permit processed and so you'll be seeing some construction up by Ginger Basil. Thank you. And next, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand which business was going in there. Midas. 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 Okay. Yep. Thank Midas you. Service Center. Yep. <clears throat> Are there any other questions? Hearing none. What's the high school report? Would you please state your first and last name? Have a seat. Um, hello, my name is Brenna Comerford, and I'm here representing Wasilla High. And here's our city council notes, if you guys are ready for them. Okay, so um, our girls basketball team finished this season as the Alaska State runner-up. They fell to a very tough ACS team in the state championship. Softball was in Kodiak this past week for their first competition, and track and field had their first meet in Anchorage at the Dome. Both baseball and soccer have competitions beginning this week. Warrior Nation has their first prom in two weeks. I mean, in two years since this Saturday, on this Saturday, April 16th, at the Bernard Sports Center. This year's theme is Casino Night. Our Warrior Spring Showcase is Wednesday, April 27th, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. in the Wasilla High School Commons. This is a great opportunity for new students, current students, 8th grade students and community members to learn about all of the excellent programs, activities, and athletics that we have at Warrior Nation. Principal Marvel will be hosting his final monthly cafe of this school year on Wednesday, April 13th. As always, City Council members and Mayor Ledford are invited. It runs from 8 to 8.30 a.m. and Warrior Nation will buy the coffee. This is a great opportunity for the City of Wasilla to learn more about what is happening in your local high school. Finally, Warrior Nation would like to wish Mayor Ledford and City Council members a happy Easter and thank you for your continued service to our community. 
Are there any questions for? Madam Mayor. Yes, Mr. Gray. I'm sorry. Uh, before you mentioned the uh, uh, principal's uh, final cafe, you mentioned something else going on also. Was that on Wednesday? Could you read that paragraph again? Um, our Warrior Spring Showcase is Wednesday, April 27th from 6.30 to 7.30 at Wasilla High School Commons. Thank you very much. And I have, I don't know if I hand this to you, but I have a little flyer for that showcase. If you can okay, uh, get it to the clerk, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate you coming and reporting at what Wasilla High Thank is doing. Here. Okay, the last report this evening is a presentation from Finance Director Tankersley on the proposed FY23-24 budget. Mr. Tankersley, you're up. We'll see how this is going to go. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Troy Tangersley, Finance Director for the City of Wasilla. It's my pleasure to bring to you the biennial budget for the 23-24 fiscal years. Um, this presentation has the following agenda. Talk about the mission, how the budget supports the mission, premises that built the budget, some core and contract service additions, highlights, and we'll touch on some general funds, special revenue funds in the enterprise. So it's the mission of the city of Wasilla to provide optimum service levels to the public as cost effectively as possible, to ensure a stable and thriving economy, promote a healthy community, provide safe environment, quality lifestyle, and promote maximum citizen participation in government. This budget proposes a balanced operating budget for FY 23 24 and achieves the goal number one set by council, which is, can be referred to on page 26 of the budget document, also on page 59 and 60. That goal specifies that the city shall pass a sustainable biennial budget in which operating expenditures will not exceed operating um, revenue. And the definition of a balanced budget is an annual budget in which revenues equal or exceed those of, ex of expenditures or an annual budget in which fund balance is approved or appropriated. And you can see by the chart there, <clears throat> Um, at the net, um, we're in positive uh, net change. It also achieves goal number two set by council, which can be referred to on page 26 of the document, where the city will maintain and improve existing services. And here, to improve those services, Administration's asking council to add two full-time equivalent positions in the Parks and Property Tech 1 classification. We also enhance our road division by continuing a million dollars in capital funding for road paving. We add one full-time equivalent for operator and training. In the Menard Center, we add one full-time equivalent for a building support laborer. And I might add here that we have not added uh, a full-time employee to the Menard for the last 10 years. We also had capital project uh, replacing the Zamboni at the Menard Center, which the Zamboni we have right now is the original Zamboni um, at the, that was when we opened the Menard. 
in human resources, we want to reclass HR generalist to HR manager and the HR assistant to an HR specialist. This comes primarily from the salary survey and those requirements and expectations set forth in the job descriptions. This budget also um, achieves goal number three, which maintains a zero mill rate. That equivalent is about $2.3 million using the FY21 certified assessment role for the bird. So the budget, I'm sorry, I thought I heard a question. Um, some budget premises here. Are there package things? Yes, sir. As long as you're open to questions. I thought our uh, property tax cap was three mil. Did I mean that wrong? Somebody, I see you see two mil on the slide. No, I used two mil on this one. Yes. Is, is that in? Cap comes from where? Our two mil is uh, equivalent to the city. I thought ours was two. So the population uh, will increase by an average of 2%, which equates to about a little over 9,000 for the city and a little over 109,000 for the Matsu Borough. The three-year average CPI will come out at 1.72%. However, 2% is used in, the, uh, in most of the union, C, um, union contracts. It's expected to climb to about 2.5% in 24. The sales tax revenue, <clears throat> the calculations came out at 7.58%, which is about one9 Million dollars. Now, obviously, this is contingent right now as we see the inflation going on and the total impact uh, to disposable income and what that's going to have. So we'll see that as as we move into 23. In 24, it's expected at three percent or six hundred thousand. This budget doesn't put in any federal or state funding, although. American Rescue Plan or the Infrastructure Bill um, may have impact there, but that will be dealt with through future appropriations for acceptance. Did you have a question? Yes. yes. Uh, now, I noticed in your projections for sales tax uh, for 2022, you have a significant decline over 2021 based on the premise that you will not have the disposable income coming into the city. I think that's what I read uh, in the presentation. So do you do we have numbers uh, for the first quarter that really support the decline from 2021? I'm not showing a decline from 21. Okay, but our projection says that it is. Um, the chart right now in this lower bottom right, the blue is where we're sitting actual to date. The red is where we're budgeted. Right. All right. So to date, we're actually higher right now than where I would anticipate us to be normally. So is what so, you're saying then is on the for the budget side, we have a fairly conservative revenue we typically, projection. And we typically do. And the foundation of that actually stems going back, um, you'd have to go back to the, about the 2009 period. Um, prior to that, we had, I don't want to say elevated projections, but they were, they were more. Um, but in 2009 is when the first time in my career doing sales tax for 20 some years was the first time I ever saw a sales tax, actual sales tax be decrease from the prior actual numbers, which is not normal. And that caused us to reevaluate how we actually project. Um, so, and that's why you're seeing this now. But I'm not anticipating a decrease. Um, the upper left chart is actually, I like this one because it really portrays how much the borough um, contributes to the city sales tax. 
finances. With intergovernmental revenue, um, it's, it's expected or it's got a decrease of about 232000 in 23 and about a $22,000 increase in 24. I did not budget municipal assistance in this particular budget, and that was primarily because the state wasn't very forthcoming in their values for municipal assistance. To date, it appears like the state's going to fully fund it. That might mean about $200,000. So um, this can be dealt with through an F, the, the uh, ordinance passes for the budget. The finance department will make the appropriate revenue correction once those values are determined. Mr. Tankersley? Yes, sir. Could, could you go through the decrease again for 2023? No, for 2022, we didn't. The decrease, I'm sorry. Yes, for the first uh, bullet there under intergovernmental revenue. So the 232000 from 22? Yes, sir. Um, to because 20. we did not, as I read through the budget, we did not anticipate any revenue sharing or... Correct. Uh, and so that makes up about 200000 ish. But for 2022, we didn't build it into the budget. 22, it has it in the budget. Oh, it did? It okay. does, yes. Read the, yeah. Thank you. Um, for user fees, um, it's anticipated to be... Uh, 5.92, a little over 5 million, and uh, 2.85 or 5.2 in 24. Now, the increase here is primarily in the Menard Center. In the last two years, we've lost about 300,000 per year due to COVID impacts. Um, and through 20, what we're seeing so far in 22, in 22 is an increase. And I believe that in 23, 24, barring anything else, that it'll continue to increase. And I'd like to see that. So, um, local and other revenue is about 3.9 million. Um, I need to point out that about 3.6 million of this is dispatch, which is about 64% of their expenditures. And I commend the dispatch, and particularly Jacob, and his forthcoming of budget. Uh, not the budget, but the contracts that are administered uh, through dispatch um, and working with finance on those. Um, with operations, it's pretty flat and about an $84,000 increase and $16,024 decrease. And so from here, um, one of the things that I like to point out when I see this is, the, is commending all departments and trying to maintain a flat budget on the operations side, especially. Um, with personnel costs, and I touched a little bit earlier and I'll touch more here um, coming forward, but those and personnel costs are expected to increase about 6.41% about 1.1 million in 23, and 5.31% or just under a million in 24. And the split of that for wages versus benefits is about 636,000 for wages and 489 under benefits. Mr. Tankersley, that sir. does include the new positions that you mentioned earlier? Yes, sir. Uh, so Mr. Tankersley, uh, do you have data to show what the personnel costs were for the previous year? So I can see kind of that comparison, if you will, from 21, 22, and then what's being proposed here? Absolutely. I can, I can either share with that um, later. I don't have it right, right here, but um, I can share with you later, sure. or starting on Wednesday when we go into uh, the department. Yeah, that would be great. I, I guess I just hold a bit of a concern here. You, know, you see an increase from last year to this year at $1.125 million. That's a lot of money. So right. I'm trying to see, you know, what's the trend in the last two years and then going forward. Um, <laughs> better explain when we get into the departments, that sure. breakdown. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
So each of the department, pardon me, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. So is what we've got here is an aggregate of all departments from the finance top down, but we'll see it in each of the departmental uh, uh, labor costs rolled in. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. It's better seen actually at the department level. Correct. Mr. Thank Kangersley, you. is it possible before Wednesday we could actually see the justifications for the new positions? Have some detail how much workload has increased, so we need, you know. Is it possible to actually have the justification for each one? I can provide the finances. We have to get with the departments themselves and assist with that. Yeah, figure out what has changed, why they believe they need these new positions. Okay. Oh, I guess. A follow-on question to Nikki's would be, uh, could you provide us job descriptions for those uh, positions from each of the departments? Sure. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, then. Um, so the city administers. Um, so the city administers uh, three union contracts, local 302. The International Union Operating Engineers. That contract uh, is set to expire March 31st, or yeah, March 31st, 23. Uh, Local 341 Labors International Union North America. Uh, that'll expire June 30 of 23. So both those contracts will enter negotiations in the FY 23 period. WPDA Wasilla Police Department Association. Excuse me, is set to expire June 30 of 22 and is in negotiations as we speak. The non represented employees are, are by W. Um, Wasilla Municipal Code 3555. The average salary increase set in this budget uh, for 23 is between 2 and 4.5. That includes CPI and steps. And then in 24, 2 to 5.5. Troy, me again. Yes. <laughs> um, I see that one of the contracts is in negotiations right now. If, if the council or someone on the council has any questions about that contract, or I know we have come to the approval process before and then had council say, oh, I think this should be changed when we're right down at the, you know, the very end. Is this the time when council should put their input into that, you know, read the contract? What don't you like? What what would you like to see change? Would that be a good time, like, right now for that or not? <clears throat> no, actually to the council. So the process for the negotiations is they are negotiation in negotiations now. They are going to come to a... Um, an agreement of some sorts um, and have a uh, tentative agreement um, set by both parties. That agreement will come to council for approval. And it's at that point in time, the council can go into executive session or not go into executive session to discuss any particulars regarding that contract. Um, if the contract is fine for council, council can adopt that um, resolution. If not, they can request their changes and goes back to the drawing board and they go back into negotiations. If there's any change to the, to the contract that impacts this particular budget, that would have to be addressed through future appropriation or what have you as an adjustment from that contract. Um, health insurance uh, rates will increase 8%. The 8% it comes from the um, collective bargaining agreements and the associated agreements through the union, primarily local 302 operators. And those collective bargaining agreements says that it can increase more than 8%. So from a budgetary aspect, we budget an increase of 8% because we don't know at this point in time what that value is going to be. 
Mr. Tankerson? Yes, sir. So with the health insurance premiums and the 8% potential bump there, uh, so like unlike the school district, we actually know what we're paying for health insurance for each employee versus just paying into a positive, correct? Right? Yes, sir. Thank you. The 8%, having that 8% in the contract is a real benefit to the city for this budgetary purpose. It's not a unknown number that we're just guessing year to year. It also helps the city to know that should the contract, or excuse me, should the rate increase more than 8%, it causes the um, uh, bargaining members, if you will, to contribute a portion above that 8%. So there's some incentive for these unions to actually keep it under that 8% mark. They're not going to want their members to pay. Um, her still is anticipated to be 22%. I haven't heard anything. Uh, there is some talk out there again about the increase and that kind of, but I haven't seen any, any movement on that. Um, and the value, the cost uh, is 2.5 and 23, 2.6 and 24. Mr. Tankersley, there uh, for 23, a 5.8% increase also, you know, in inclusively reflects the uh, five new FTEs and the four the, new FTEs, four yes. new FTEs, yeah. and, the, and the two uh, increases uh, in uh, HR. And then uh, twenty-four. Is that including any uh, change in our FTEs? Because that's a pretty substantial. No, four point eight is pretty substantial. So when you say four point eight, that's a four point eight percent increase over twenty-three. Uh, that is 4.8% increase, but you're at, you're looking at anywhere between a two and a half to five and a half percent bump in wages uh, due to CPI and steps. Thank you. So some fiscal policies that uh, developed this budget. <clears throat> the city's goal is to pay all reoccurring or pay for all reoccurring expenditures with reoccurring revenues, which is the balanced budget. Non-reoccurring revenues, non-reoccurring expenditures. Um, the individual department uh, budgets uh, submissions must be prepared with the basic assumption that council will always attempt to maintain the current tax rate. And budget review by administration and council will focus on basic concepts of staff economy, limits the staff increases to areas where improved program growth and support absolutely require additional staff. Capital construction based on non-debt financing and comprehensive capital program. Program expansions must be submitted with a detailed budgetary increment and will be scrutinized on the basis of relationship of health, safety, and welfare of the community. Although we don't have any new programs, it's the same as uh, program expansions. Next slide, please. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, existing programs is justification that the base budget program costs will be a major factor, which simply says that we use existing budgets, uh, activity, um, stats, those type of things to support the existing budgets going forward. Administrative costs, uh, administration, administrative overhead costs will be kept at a minimum. And then the city will integrate performance measurement and productivity indicators into the budget. Well, I have one more question on that. Um, you said the performance measurements and productivity indicators, would that be like per department or is that individual evaluations? Department evaluations. What can it's you it's by department, and you see those in the inside the budget. Um, and we try to relate those performance measurements and justifications inside there, and and both there's department um, performance, if you will, mm -hmm. and and benchmarking as well as trying to tie those those goals and benchmarks back to the council's goals and initiatives set by council. And you'll see that inside the budget um, for the departments as well. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, let's see. The city will also keep a positive unassigned fund balance in all governmental funds, which is the general fund, the special revenue funds, debt service funds, and capital projects funds. And when you speak specifically to the general fund, uh, while well, Solomon's Code 504 specifies that we maintain an unassigned portion of the general fund balance at the 50 to 60 percent threshold, um, and this really um, speaks to the ability for the city, <coughs> should a catastrophe occur to the city, that the city can operate in six months, seven months um, of operations. Values of those for 23 is between 9.1 to 11 million and 24, 9.3 to 11.2. Those can be found on page 61 and 62 of the budget document. And the city always tries to maintain the maximum level of that unassigned value. Even though, as it specifies, the general fund will consume 682,023 and uh, 241,024. Will that keep us at a certain percentage, Mr. Tankerson? I'm sorry? Do you know what percentage that will keep us at as far as the... the maximum unassigned. Yeah, 60. Maximum. Thank you. We're always at the maximum level. And this graph here just simply shows the dark blue portion of the, the block is the unassigned value. The light blue portion is that is the committed or the assigned values, those portions of fund balance we can't touch. And the line, the upper line, is the maximum threshold, and the lower line being the minimum. To touch on contract service, uh, well, it, it's additions and deletions, and really it's, it's more it should read changes, if you will, to me. But um, this is really about what I refer to as personnel enhancements, and this is about providing the service at the levels that the city expects. Um, and in public works, and I, I mentioned some of these before, in public works division, we want to administration is proposing to add two full-time equivalent parks and property tech one positions. We currently have two. However, we, we want to reclass those four positions into, um, into the higher grade level um, to equate that to the other tech one type positions. In water and sewer, we want to add a full-time equivalent operator and training position. We currently have three operator and training positions that have reached certifications. Those we'd like to reclass into a water, wastewater tech positions. So we have tech, we have tech one, and we have tech two. By adding the operator and training position, it allows us to continue training for someone to come in out of high school or what have you and still maintain the training in that operator and training positions between both. Just a quick question. Yes. Um, so the pay that we have here, for example, for the operator and training, you have $84,003. Is that including benefits for that yes. particular position? Yes, it does. So what is the uh, overall pay then for that technician without benefits? What's the hourly? Uh, I can get that for you. I don't have that off the top of my head. Thanks. So Mr. Tankersley, uh, going back over your numbers here, you know, you're adding two time, two full-time equivalent property techs, and then you're reclassifying uh, the tech ones from pay grade B to pay grade C. The, the 26951 is inclusive of all four positions, is that correct? No, the 26000 is really the um, two existing positions, and the uh, 204000 is adding the two positions. I tried to split that, and thanks for that. Sure. Um, in the Menard Center, uh, adding the one full-time equivalent building support labor, 
Um, again, I reference that because we have not had a, a new position for the last 10 years. And the human resources, as I touched on before, um, that comes from a couple sources, both in, salary, uh, in the salary study that was done, that they were undervalued, as well as the job description and requirements that administration is setting forth on HR. In WPD patrol, uh, administration wishes to reclass the police lieutenants. And I'm going to touch on MATCOM and reclassing the uh, records and communication manager also. Both of those are going into um, a grade 24 level, which is in essence equivalent to your deputy director levels across the city. In the WPD garage, um, the mechanic position was originally added to a non rep pay scale. Um, it's fitting that mechanic. Uh, fall inside the local 3-2 operators. There's currently an MOA, uh, Memorandum of Agreement, with local 302 um, to move it into the operator pay scales. Who does that mechanic uh, report to? I mean, there was a lot of discussion when we... Ultimately, it's the chief. Um, okay. But it, I understand, and the chief can correct me on this, but it would report to uh, one of the lieutenants. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, just pretty much breaks down it by percentage of the uh, of the operating budget. Um, we often look at. In this case, public safety stands out at 46% 46, 46 um, amount, which is not uncommon for public safety, and certainly not uncommon over the years um, with the city budget. These next uh, few slides just really give by uh, type the percentage allocation, if you will. How sales tax is so prevalent, so important to the city. Not 65% of total operating revenue in 23 and 24, almost 66% in 24. And on the expenditure side, again, some allocations there, but. <laughs> Now to move into the general fund specifically, <clears throat> the general fund appropriation is 25.5 million, of which 3.9 million is in the And in 24, it's 25.7 million, followed by 3.3 million of transfers. The sales tax makes up 79% of 23 and 24, and we still maintain that the zero mill levy. Slide just pretty much breaks that down uh, by type of the revenue source. <coughs> Again, the percentages of, uh, of revenue, both in 23, and again, the importance of sales tax to the general fund. And then on expenditures, you can see the, both the increase and the percent change uh, by function. And this slide, slide 26, um, speaks to the transfer specifically and breaks them between operations and capital. And on the 23 uh, chart, I need to make a correction under the Curtis Menard Memorial Center. The operation number of 775 should actually read 750,000. And on the capital side, it should read 250,000, not 225. In total, it's fine. And in the budget, 
what's reflected in the transfers in the budget document is fine. And under this slide, it gives the percentages and changes um, for the expenditures in the general fund. And, and here I'd like to point out another correction that was made to me, and thank you, Council Member uh, Johnson, that in on page five of the budget document, uh, I need to make a correction. In FY23, on page five, it references 49900 it should reference 749900 but it has no impact whatsoever to the budget ordinance itself. These next few slides break down by function, <coughs> by type of the general fund expenditures. Moving into the special revenue funds, <clears throat> we, the city currently has four special revenue funds. We have the youth court fund, we have the state and the federal four feature funds, and the CARES Act fund. The youth court fund uh, for 23 uh, is appropriating $89,913, of which 777700 comes from contributions from other governments with 3500 in class fees. And then on 8713 would be appropriated from its fund balance uh, carried over from 22. And 24 it increases to 94, uh, a little over 94,000 with the same contributions and 13,497 in appropriation of fund balance. We don't have any appropriation. Uh, request for the asset forfeiture funds, nor the CARES Act fund, obviously. Please. So in another document, I read that the city may drop this program in Wait. the future. Um, so I, I make reference in the budget document um, over the years when it, we talk about the youth core fund, it is, um, it's very reliant upon the contributions by other governments. And as, as you're seeing here, we end up consuming fund balance over time. And as that fund balance lowers, we get to a point where we kind of have to step up our game a little bit and ask for contributions, increase those contributions, and support the youth court program. Um, and that can come from contributions uh, of other governments, it can come from donations and the, and the like. The city um, contributes in-kind donations, the use of the police department, the use of its facilities and its equipment, those type of things. Um, and in the past, the other governments have stepped up when, when that time arises. But it's just something the city needs to be mindful of as we move from fiscal year to fiscal year. So it's what you're saying is should the Matsu Borough pull the funding the program then would be at risk. Right, so we receive 25,000 uh, from the Matsu Borough and we receive to 54,000 from legal justice. Um, it's that portion that I'm more worried about. Um, it's obviously a larger share of the pie. Um, so. But even, even losing the 25,000 would be critical. So moving into the enterprise funds, we have four enterprise funds, the sewer fund, the water fund, the airport fund, and the Curtis Menard Memorial Center. And the chart below and, and shows the appropriations for those and its uh, allocated percentages. And 
And these next couple slides give the breakdown of the operations roadmap. And the importance of, of this slide, really, I, always, I like to point out, is the fund stabilization component of this, which is the second line from the bottom. It's the city's policy to hold 50% in each one of these funds as a fund stabilization for the same reason as we do with the general fund. It's to maintain a six month reserve in case they need to operate in the future. And then again in 24. Another policy that the city has, it's, it's the um, that position unrestricted, whereby we hold back 10%. We want that net position to be at least 10% um, for uh, the use of catastrophic issue, if you will, a broken pipe. Now, in looking at other fiscal policies um, over the years, it's becoming very prevalent that a reserve of approximately 20% is more in order. And, and really where that's coming from is, if you think about the cost of goods and services, you break a pipe and how much it costs to actually get that pipe back in the ground. And um, right now our 10%, if you got a $20 million, you're talking about a $2 million threshold there, you can't get very far on $2 million. And we, if anybody, um, saw what happened in Palmer, that was a great example, and they had to deal with theirs. So it's just something, uh, our policy doesn't, is not proposing a 20% right now, but it is something that the city should probably think about or consider in the future. Uh, debt service funds, we all know, and we stand on this one, is we have no debt. So, uh, Debt service funds, uh, and we pretty proud of that one. And the capital improvement plan. This is in summary. Um, it's all local funded, with the exception of twenty-five thousand. There, it's a small part uh, being appropriated to continue a uh, small CIP portion of the WPD uh, garage. The details of, the, of these can be found on three pages 325 and 326 of the document. We'll go in more in depth as we get into the uh, um, budget summaries with the departments. With that, any other questions we might have? Does anyone have questions? I just wanted to summarize that we have a good copy of the information requested. If I may, Madam Mayor, the justifications for each of the new positions and the job descriptions, as well as on the new positions, Member Sullivan Leonard, the salary breakdown versus the benefits. Did I capture that correctly? Thank you. Okay. Councilman Johnson has a question. Did you have a question? Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Tangersley, on page 102 of your general philosophies and goals of the situation uh, of the uh, proposed budget, uh, I just sort of read through and I was looking through a general comment within uh, my company that I work for. One of the main goals that we have, at least at the director level, is to make sure that our budget actually becomes not at budget but below budget if, if possible, trying to create an, ascent, uh, an incentive to do better than what we do on the budget. You know, I mean, the goal would not necessarily mean that if we put the money into the budget that we're expecting the department to spend it, but to actually return money if they possibly can. So is there any thought of adding that sort of as a intellectual goal for our budgeting process? Um, Sorry to throw that one on you. Well, I, I, uh, I want to I commend you on that because from my stance, that's exactly what I, I try to uh, encourage departments. Um, 
But it's kind of like, uh, you know, the child getting the allowance and taking them to the candy store, right? And they're going to they're gonna want to spend that dollar that you just gave them. So, um, so it's kind of twofold, right? I mean, we're, we're appropriating and allowing a department by line item um, should they need it to spend it. Um, likewise, they have the ability within their departments to move monies around. Um, as, as necessary to keep operations in check. Um, so uh, it's, it's good when we don't spend what, what we've appropriated. It's good that uh, we keep the budget in check without actually having to come to council and ask for more. Um, and it's, uh, it's good when we can lapse that funding. It's, it's not like... Uh, it's not like we're saving the dollar, but at the same time, we're not spending it either. So, um, so yeah, you know, it is an encouragement from the finance department to all the departments. Thank you. Is there any further questions? I think us being debt free is a testament to how well our departments really take care of the people it's the people's money it's not ours and i think each department should be commended for uh, the way that they do take care of the budget because otherwise we couldn't be debt free thank you troy okay we are now at public participation there is one ordinance scheduled for public hearing this evening and madam clerk please read the title of the ordinance thank you that's ordinance serial number 2209 amending the fiscal year 2022 budget by appropriating funds in the amount of ninety nine thousand two hundred and eighty six dollars for third quarter budget adjustments to cover budget shortfalls for the airport code compliance roads and library the public hearing on ordinance serial number 22-09 is open. Anyone who would like to testify, please come forward and begin by stating your first and last name. Comments are limited to three minutes per person. Hearing none, the public hearing is closed. Is there a motion to adopt ordinance serial number 22-09? Madam Mayor? Yes. I move ordinance serial number... 2209. Slim Brown, second. And Madam Mayor, could we have the administration give an overview then for when we get to discussion? Okay, thank you. It has been moved by Council Member uh, Sullivan Leonard and seconded by Council Member Brown to adopt ordinance serial number 22 09. Is there discussion? Now, Colleen. Yes, Madam Mayor, could I please have administration give an overview for? the requests and justification for that. Okay. Mr. Tankersley. Council, uh, speaking specifically, these, there's, there's four departments, if you will, that have shortfalls uh, caused by uh, different aspects, if you will. And in the library, we have a building that had uh, damage caused by a vehicle. Um, and there's Non, there's not sufficient funding to actually spend with the budget, um, nor is there CIP funding um, available also. Um, now, that all being said, yes, insurance is being dealt with, and, and yes, the you know, driver of the vehicle's insurance is being dealt with. That doesn't uh, negate the fact that the appropriation in the budget needs to happen for those repairs to actually take place. In code compliance. Oh, can um, I ask on that then, please, Madam Mayor? Yes. Just real quickly, Troy, if I could. So, are you saying then that insurance would cover part of the cost then for that, and is the 30000 then expected to be kind of backfilled then from that so, insurance payment? Right, insurance. So, when it comes to the city's insurance, we have a $10,000 deductible on the property. So, um, at a minimum, we're going to spend 10000 we, if we can accomplish uh, receiving funding from, from our insurance company, which our insurance company is going to go after their insurance company. Uh, so, um, yeah, so it would be less that, that 10000 
but uh, well, we need the full amount to actually get the building. And this comes, uh, the, this amount is actually coming from a quote that, uh, from a contractor. Actually. Okay, thank you. Okay. And the code compliance, this really deals with legal. Uh, these are legal costs. Uh, Some, some challenges for us. So this was non-budgeted originally in this department and uh, not foreseen, obviously. Danielle, uh, public works director, Um, so for roads and airports, um, uh, part of our expense here as to why we are at requesting more funding is we've had about twice as much snow this year as we had last year. And um, that has created, you know, our prison staff, they're doing a great job, um, but unfortunately that does use some fuel consumption on that part. Um, we've had uh, some maintenance as well. And um, currently in the airport, you'll see that we're requesting, uh, the funds we're requesting is in approximate uh, $8,000 that is needed to repair the heat and get that usable. And then our blower out of the airport as well is in needs of repair and it's currently in a state where we can't use it because we don't want to damage it further until it's repaired. We sure we're maintaining that equipment properly. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, please take a roll call vote on the adoption of Ordinance Serial Number 22-09. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Sullivan Leonard? Uh, yes. Councilmember Graham? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Brown? Yes. Councilmember Vlock? Yes. Councilmember Rubio? Yes. The motion to adopt ordinance serial number 2209 passes unanimously with council members Sullivan Leonard, Graham, Johnson, Brown, Vlock, and Rubio in favor. We are on to 7.2, which is persons to be heard. Uh, we have a sign up sheet. Okay. Um, the first one is Eileen. Lickenstein. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council members. Eileen Falkenstein representing Wasilla Area Seniors Incorporated. I sent out a flyer for you folks about our Miles for Meals campaign. We're starting that again this year. That's our biggest fundraiser. Supports, um, our goal this year is $75,000. It's a high goal, and we're hoping to meet it. We are on track to deliver 125,000 meals this year. Yeah, a lot of meals. And um, we will be doing our 5K run, walk, or virtual this year again. The actual 5K will take place on June 25th at WASI on Century Circle. It will begin registering at 9 a.m. with the run starting at 10 a.m and they're starting to figure out a format for that because there's going to be construction supposedly on KGB. So they're trying to see if they can come up with an alternate route than the one that we typically use, maybe a little more safe. Um, you can also do it virtually, which a lot of people do. They take a hike, take a walk, take pictures, turn it in. That's their 5K. We'll also be doing a barbecue after it this year, which we had typically done before, and we're going to be able to start doing that again. We are doing our online auction this year. People really liked that last year. We are currently looking for donations for the auction. If anybody's crafty, if anybody has something they'd like to donate to the auction, that is a way to support the Mouse for Meals. And also, of course, donations are always accepted for that. We will be having our Easter meal on Friday. 
for residents and guests if you'd like to come have Easter lunch with us. It'll be baked ham, mashed potatoes, gravy, salad, soup, and dessert. And that is Mouse for Meals and Wazi this time. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Anyone, anyone have any questions for? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next step is Jennifer Anderson. And Ms. Anderson, you have three minutes. Good evening. May you state your oh, uh, name? My and name first is last. My name is Jennifer Anderson. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. I am the head coach for the Wasilla High School tennis team. And I'm really coming to sort of shed some light and begin a conversation in regards to the tennis courts at the Adida Park. You're all sort of shaking your head. Um, I have been in conversation with um, Bob Walden in regards to that. Um, our sort of, it fell flat. We're, um, we were looking at Matthew Health Foundation to help us out with some of that. They declined. Um, we need to look at perhaps the Parks and Rec. Um, I have spoken with the Matsu School Board as well. I went to a meeting um, last month. They're interested in hopefully partnering with the city of Wasilla <laughs> since it is a city park. I not only coach um, there, but our PE teams or uh, PE classes actually walk down there in the fall and the spring. We have a racket sports um, PE class, so it's not only just our tennis team using it, our school is using it as well. We also um, are in competition with Palmer Colony. Podia comes up, they're in our division, and we play there. We use those courts from the end of July through the beginning of October, um, five days a week consistently, uh, sometimes Saturdays. We can, I mean, we accommodate at times if we have a JV match, up to 50 kids on those two courts. Um, and my husband and actually, I actually stopped by there on our way here <coughs> just to see if the nets were up. Um, some of the issues are the nets are torn. Um, and there are numerous, numerous cracks in the asphalt, um, like two inches thick, and there's weeds growing out of them. I just noticed the backboard is missing. I don't know if it was taken down for the winter, but it's gone. Um, and there's weeds growing out of the cracks. The other um, issue is there's, um, in the summer, a large amount of bees that are in those cracks. I've had um, players get stung. I myself was stung and ended up in urgent care. So um, we appreciate, on behalf of Wasilla High School, um, Principal Marvel and our athletic director, we do appreciate the city's um, allowing us to use that facility cost-free. Um, I just would like to begin those conversations to partner with you all to see if there's something we can do to get those fixed. I know there was um, a bid from 2019 that was about 40 grand to just resurface them. My understanding is at this point, because they're so damaged, they would probably have to be dug up. So I appreciate your time and consideration and um, hope that in the future we can work together. Okay. Thank you. Any uh, questions? Yes. Anderson, could I ask a question if I could? Sure. You mentioned that resurfacing the courts at one point was about $40,000. That's the the bid that um, Bob Walden had emailed to myself and our athletic director. That was from 2019. Um, to replace, sounds like you're going to replace and essentially put in new courts. Well, and that's kind of was the conversation. I can tell you right now, Palmer's in... Palmer courts are in the process of having that done. They do have three courts. They're looking at 150 grand. Um, for so, three courts. For three courts. And I think the envision that Mr. Walden had um, sort of conveyed to us was that there were community members writing letters and they were sort of asking, hey, can we add a couple of courts? You know, so we have four instead of two. And I will tell you, just not myself, Every single day when we have practice, we practice from three to five, there's people waiting to get on those courts. They're always busy. Um, you know, so as, I, I mean, the consideration would be much appreciated. Would the public works director like to weigh in? I would love to. Um, so we just submitted a grant application to Matsu Trails Foundation and 
And I believe the quote that you're talking about, I could be wrong, but I believe it was in the amount of 30,000, and we were expecting to see an increase because, as you stated, it is a 2019 bid. Um, our understanding uh, is that the Palmer courts are in worse condition than the Wessler courts, so it would be, and, and I don't know exactly because I haven't gone back out there with the contractor to take a look, um, but um, what we're hoping to do is we are hoping to still resurface those courts, and there are some specialty things that are, are required with the tennis courts versus just like a resurfacing project in a, in a parking lot. Um, but the hope is that we can go ahead and um, get those funds those grant funds available and resurface the courts before they are in complete disarray and, and can't be happy to continue with them. So that is actually currently in process and the letter that you wrote was provided as a part of that grant application and um, we were speaking with them on Friday and I expect that um, we should be hearing some good news back soon. Okay. I'm happy to share that with you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I have spoke with uh, Wasilla Rotary I spoke um, at a meeting there in a couple, oh, a few weeks ago, and I think they're willing to, to help out a little bit. If, you know, push comes to shove and we need to, you know, come together with some additional funds. Um, I have a time to see a little bit from the Uni uh, from the U.S. Tennis Association. Um, I, you know, I know it's a city venue, but I have a lot of volunteers that are willing to, you know, I have kids and dads and moms and, you know, so, when it comes time, knock on our door, so. Okay, I would encourage you to stay in touch with our public works director, uh, Ms. Bischoff, and uh, she can keep you up to speed. Okay, perfect, thank you. Madam uh, Mayor. Yes. We all have questions. Okay, okay. everybody's got questions. Okay. Let's start with Simon. Okay, uh, to the Parks and Rec Director. Um, you said you uh, have put in for a grant but if that grant doesn't come through soon, but some are approaching us fastly, what is your plan of plan to come to the city or what is your plans? So we already submitted that grant application and in our um, discussion with them, they believe that they can fund this. So uh, that's the avenue that we've been pursuing at this time. Um, if that is not available, I'd have to get back to us with that plan. Okay. Elaine Sullivan Leonard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Ms. Anderson, have you had a chance to talk with the uh, Matsu Tennis Association also? I know they use our courts. And, yes, um, so. A um, collaborative effort maybe of all the yep, tennis groups trying absolutely. to. Absolutely. I've been, I've been in contact with them. Um, uh, they're uh, sort of the head is the colony high school coach, and so we've been working together. I think that um, they're so. Um, they're, they're so enthralled with Palmer right now that, you know, they're like, as soon as we're done with Palmer, then we'll talk to you, you know, type of thing. So that's, you know, it's really kind of we're at the point of, you know, getting the ball rolling, looking at things, you know, reaching out, bringing awareness to where it's at. And how new is the tennis program for Wasilla High? So, I know they didn't before, so. So Wasilla High, I have been the head coach for the last two years. I assistant coached the previous year, so I've been with them for three years. Before that, I think it was um, about four years. So it's been about seven years total, I, is my understanding. Um, in the beginning, the first four years, actually the first five years, it was a club. Um, so after I took over as head coach, we changed to a full-fledged ASAA sport. And so we um, are in competition with not only Valley teams, but when we go to state, we're um, in state competition. I've actually taken, um, I have some region champs that I've taken to state to play, a girls double team, some a girls singles team. Um, and so, you know, we're really working into a full-fledged sport in order to be super competitive with um, Anchorage athletes they get to play indoors all year long we really want you know we, the facility is really what is going to help and um, at this point you know um, Palmer is a little rough we're pretty rough I mean the water's not draining there's days we can't play because the water's pooling the um, tennis coating is gone in some spots so I mean everybody I mean it seems like everybody um, who's has a uh, horse in the game is sort of, you know, on board, so. Sounds good. And then, Madam Mayor, if I could just direct a question to Danielle real quick. 
Um, with the increase now with use of the, the tennis courts, kind of based on what the schedule was previously for um, repairing the courts and, and to now, um, what is your schedule on that? I mean, have you looked at, I know you're new, but has they looked, have they looked at it like maybe every other year, making sure that the courts are uh, smooth, paved, no rocks, the nets are good, and uh, is it an annual thing, or is it something kind of every other year they've looked at? Mm -hmm. So I can't speak to what's happened in the past, except to say that I know that my parks crew are out there in the park and taking a look at what's going on in the facilities to try to maintain them to the best of their ability. Um, and uh, with the expansion, I don't have um, a plan as to when that will happen. We did put in the initial plan in the grant application to to expand and have more courts. That part of um, it, they don't have funding for that at that this time because they are focusing more of their dollars on those Palmer courts this year and resurfacing them. Um, we do expect that they have. Uh, the opportunity to submit again on a rotating schedule for additional grant funding from, from that organization, and we, we anticipate to still submit further in the future. Um, I would love to have a wonderful schedule for you for all things that we're planning, and uh, I, I hope to be able to provide those documents out to the public in the future. Sounds good, and kind of what I'm looking for is just the operations and maintenance then of not just the court, but the basketball court and all the parks and kind of, you know, what we're looking towards. Because spring's coming, right? Spring's here, and now we've got courts that aren't quite up to par. But I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just looking for a maintenance schedule that we can, you know, keep on. Yeah, thank you. Is there further discussion? Madam Mayor? Yes. Uh, in your report on page 7, top line, uh, there was funding that you put in for Iditarod Park, or Lake Lakefield Campground, that has nothing then to do with the potential upgrades to Iditarod Park itself. Is that correct? No. It's not in It was my understanding that um, I believe, and don't hold me to which rotary it is, but I thought it was Susitna Rotary was going to take a hard look at um, upgrading the Idita Park because, uh, you know, all that equipment over there is way old. It's breaking down. So they were going to do that. Okay. Thank you. But stay in touch okay. because these kids need something to do to keep them busy. I appreciate your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next, uh, Brian White. And Brian, you'll state your uh, name and you have three minutes. Hello, I'm Brian White. I'm here speaking on behalf of my son, Devin White. I'm sure some of you read in the newspapers and the Anchorage Daily News about the remains of a teenage boy who was found at Big Lake Elementary. That was him. So what I'm, what I'm here to share with you is the uh, other part of the story that you may not be familiar with. Well, my son was reported as a runaway. He, he wanted to do drugs, he was not allowed to, so he left. And when the troopers brought him home, they bragged that he had given them information that led to more arrests than they had handcuffs and cop cars for, and that's why he was being brought home, even though I pleaded with him, with him that he was not safe at home, that he needed to be put into a detention facility. He was denied. Um, since he's passed, we were looking at Big Lake community and what we can do to help all the other kids, his friends, their families, in support of doing away with such the wickedness and evilness. And one thing that my wife, Yana, and I had come up with is to put uh, anonymous tip boxes throughout the town. And that way, the children that are having problems can put a slip into a box. We'll check it, but I'm looking for a place where I can advertise that, make it public, so that these problems can be brought up. And the reason I need it public is because there was a young lady at my son's candle lighting venue who brought to the attention of everybody who was there. It's more than 200 people. She said that my son had been walking her home after school because it was unsafe. And 
then her words were printed in the newspaper article. And the fact that she had an unsafe condition to get home to, and when I went to the Big Lake City Council about it, there was still nothing done to help her situation. So I know the young boys and women, the sons and daughters of our communities are not being heard. The, the protection's not available, and I want to provide a service in that regard for them. Um, I was told that my son's life was in danger, and I did call the state troopers to let them know that, and they told me there's nothing they can do to help. I'm not blaming the state troopers. I know that they're spread thin, but I think if their problems were addressed as well as ours, that as a community, we could work together to help each other out and end the finger pointing and instead unify and become working together as a team. Thank you. Thank you. Is there questions from uh, the council? Mr. Johnson. Mr. White, I certainly offer you our con heartfelt condolence. Any of these drug-related deaths just should not happen. It's, you know, it's a failure, obviously, of multiple areas within our society. And I think you have heard. And so thank you for coming forward. Mr. Graham. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, uh, thank you, Mr. White. You know, Devin uh, was well known throughout the community and um, folks in his uh, generation. I'm sure the candlelight vigil was, uh, was very well attended by his uh, friends. But uh, you mentioned putting uh, tip boxes. And when I say tip, I mean not money boxes, but, but uh, boxes where persons could leave information regarding any crime could you t expand on that just a little bit or so since this happened and we have the lighting venue there's been children that have been coming to my home and parents as well expressing their own personal concerns one child wanted to cook with vegetables because their home doesn't have vegetables so i thought maybe if they would advertise their problem, we could start maybe a kitchen where children could begin cooking with foods that they want to have in their lives, you know, like the wholesome food groups. But it's not just that. There's, there's people talking about um, trees that are on their power lines disturbing their service, and they're being ignored because they're in the rural, rural further part of the world. And so I thought if I could get their problem and advertise it, we could give each appropriate agency the chance to respond at least so that the people know they're being heard and if they're not then as a community maybe we can help each other out where the appropriate authorities whatever they may be don't have the time or the resources to get to it. Is there a specific way that you would like to implement this or are we kind of still on in the infancy stages at this point? Infancy absolutely but in the beginning I mean I the only experience that I have with holding anyone accountable is, is to present the details. So the day the tip is found, figuring out the appropriate authority, the time that that information is given to them, all recorded, give them a time frame. If it's an imminent danger threat, obviously a shorter time frame than anything else, but give them a time frame to investigate or respond, perhaps a callback saying that, you know, whether or not that, that tip led anywhere if it was a waste of time obviously we don't want that so we, i could do some research on my own i'm not exactly sure it's entirely infancy but just having that information the timestamps, you know you can order a, a, a domino's pizza and you can see when it's in the oven to when it's getting to your door so why can't we track you know more dangerous or safety concerns i think is kind of the route i'm going with this and you mentioned you talked to some folks in big lake uh which I'm assuming was the Houston City Council. Big Lake doesn't have a city council, but have you spoken with anybody in the uh, Matsu Health Foundation or in their, seems like this. My house, maybe. Seems like this, like there are organizations that could be more helpful than a city council and a government. I just recently attended um, a Zoom meeting. It was my first Zoom meeting. Well, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, North Star, I believe, is the, the company behind it, but it, they call themselves the Alaskan Task Force for Substance Abuse, and they, the way I understood it to be that they were going to tackle issues related with the substance abuse, but what they're actually focused on is treating the users and the substance abusers and, and helping them get back onto the right path. 
So they're, they're, they got nine or so providers that they're, they're building a larger facility and they're, you know, they're doing all the things that they can to, in my opinion, help keep users healthy enough to maybe fall out of the lines of recovery and continue being users. And I see that money going right back to the problem. I see it as more of a, a you know, we're, we're dealing with the symptom and not so much the source. Oh, I see it. Thank Mayor. you, Mr. White. Mr. Brown. Uh, you mentioned the city, a big lake city council. But have you asked for a community meeting with the people coming to your house, kids and adults, from the trooper commander, and maybe having them come out and listen to the problems and other agencies such as that, and asking them for a city community council meeting with your friends at a house or community center? Um, Calling the phone them and asking for help. You're going to get no a lot of time, but sometimes going to the top and asking for them to come out in person and meet with you. You mean uh, the Alaskan State Troopers Commander? Yes. So they won't even re respond or reply to a text or a call. I've gotten not a single response back from them since. I mean, in the very beginning, they came to my door to tell me they found my son's remains. And then they came back another time to follow up on information that I'd given them and to look through his belongings. And they gave me their numbers and they said to stay in touch with them and that, that's it. I'm not getting any information back from them. I'm not the kind of person to... I understand when somebody's busy. I don't want to cause a problem to your busyness. I want you to be able to get your job done. so I don't want to interrupt you constantly. Um, my my ex-wife did, is more of a nuisance than I am, and she did follow up until they told her that, look, we don't have time to deal with just another overdose teenager. And my problem with that information is he was giving them information to bust the bad guys. And when they brought him home and I told him, look, um, he's going to be in danger even more now than ever before. The trooper gave me her ID card and her phone number. She said, if there's ever any danger, call me. And it was three or four days later, I got information that the bad guys were looking for him to kill him. And I called her to tell her that his case had been transferred to another trooper, so she didn't have time for it. And that trooper, we waited a day and a half. And when I finally got in touch with him, he had already, my son had already been transferred to another trooper. And then it was just days later, I was informed of his passing, so. I mean, I, I, I went and called the Alaska Crime Tip Line to express my dissatisfaction with, like, what can I do with him to, but. So the community would be nice to get together and have a meeting. I understand there's a, a woman who's buying a hangar out, out in the Big Lake area and that she's looking to maybe create some type of clubhouse where it would be open 24 hours so that the children could, you know, maybe go to, but I don't know her name. I've never met her. My family and I are still really, really, uh, relatively new to the area, so we don't have a lot of the networking that would be required for something this big. And one last thing, I would recommend strongly, and I can talk to you offline, outside of this, to give you some direct numbers, but also uh, a neighborhood watch, which get the community involved, and the troopers sit that help you set that up, and they do have time for that if you call the right number. Neighborhood Watch would be a perfect thing because you already got people coming to your house talking about problems. So now make it a formalized process, but we can talk more. Thank you. Any further questions? Hearing none. And again, uh, Mr. White, my sincere uh, condolences. I can't imagine losing a child. That's, uh, that's horrible. You know, uh, did he go to Houston High School? Yes. Okay, we have a resource officer that works in Houston High School. And I wonder if things would have been different if he had took the initiative to talk to our resource officer there. Actually, because of my son's behavior, I asked that he be searched before entering the school and before getting back onto the bus. My son was well known in that school. 
So, I mean, as so a you parent, don't know if he had any interaction with a resource officer or not. Are you, do you mean the police officer? He's in the he school. Did. He knew his. Yeah, they knew each other. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. We are going to take a about a seven minute break. It is seven thirty. Uh, where are we at? Consent agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are now at the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, please read the title of the items for approval under the consent agenda. Madam Mayor, and I do apologize for my froggy voice. <laughs> we have the regular meeting minutes of March 14th, 2022. We have one introduction with the recommended public hearing date of April 25th, 2022, and that's Ordinance Serial Number 2210, amending Wasilla Municipal Code Chapter 2.56, Disaster Emergency Planning by Adopting Section 2.56130, Waiver of Fees, allowing the City Council to grant mayor authority to reduce or waive permit and application fees arising from a disaster for up to one year after the expiration of such emergency. Our next introduction, we have two public hearing dates on that. That's April 25th and April 27th, 2022. Ordinance serial number 2022, providing for the adoption of the annual budget for fiscal year 2023 and operating funds to carry out said budget, no resolutions, and one action memorandum, AM number 2206, contract award to Circle K Corporation, formerly Holiday Station Stores, in the amount of $34,540 for the purchase of unleaded gasoline and fleet fuel card services for the remainder of fiscal year 2022, and $186,450 for nine months of fiscal year 2023. Okay. Do I have a motion? So moved, Madam Mayor. Second. Uh, then the consent agenda is approved as read into the record. Uh, we have no unfinished business. Under new business, 10.1, uh, uh, I have not taken any new measures in response to COVID-19. And uh, Madam Clerk, please read the ordinance under new business. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That's, this was moved off of our consent agenda, uh, recommended for a public hearing on April 25th, if the council desires. That's ordinance serial number 2211, amending the fiscal year 2022 budget by appropriating $200,000 within the vehicle fund, Wasilla Police Department Patrol Division, for the purchase of 2023 police package Chevrolet Tahoes. Okay. Okay. Is there a motion on ordinance uh, serial number 22-11? Madam Mayor, I move that we introduce for public hearing on April 25th of 2022 ordinance serial number 22-11. Is there a second? I'll second. The motion's been made by Mr. Graham and seconded by uh, Ms. Colleen Sullivan Leonard. And uh, is there discussion? Mr. Bur uh, somebody. Somebody. Whoever's down on that. Yeah, next to Mr. Brown. Yeah. Mr. Graham. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known. Yeah, that's kind of an insult, just so you know. Yeah. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry. Yeah. So I'm not really looking uh, to have a big discussion on this. I just wanted uh, to make it clear to uh, Mr. Tankersley and to Chief Long uh, that I am concerned uh, that uh, we are getting vehicles that are too big for our needs. Uh, I, I uh, agree that the Chevy Tahoes are nice and that uh, our uh, patrol sergeant should have those available to him, but for the average uh, patrolman, I think this is too much vehicle. I think we're paying too much for it. I think the operating costs are too high on this vehicle compared to the type of uh, vehicle that we're using now. So I would like on the 25th uh, for you to come loaded for bear to give me a bunch of information on why we need uh, bigger, more expensive vehicles, which are more expensive to operate. That was my purpose for uh, moving this to the agenda. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Is there further discussion? 
Madam Mayor? Going. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, could we have Tori or Chief Long just give an overview real quick about um, how we're utilizing the funds and for how many vehicles we're looking at for purchasing? Chief Long through the mayor to Councilman Sullivan Leonard. We are trying to replace a fleet that has been aging. And we went with the Chevy Tahoes, I believe it was two fiscal years ago. And because of supply delays, we didn't get those until this current fiscal year for delivery. So we have an opportunity with the state contract that opens in May to be able to buy under the state contract, which is a considerably reduced price for these vehicles. Um, the problem is, is that it's before our fiscal year starts, July 1. And what we're doing is we budgeted for six new Tahoes in fiscal year 23 in the budget that you're getting ready to review. And what we're proposing to do is to take half of the funds that we have proposed to use in 23 and order these Tahoes on the state contract opening in May. And then we would outfit them once they arrive in fiscal year 23 with the remaining funds that we had set aside for them. Follow up, Madam Mayor. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to expand on that just just a little bit. That if uh, this appropriating ordinance uh, passes uh, in the current fiscal year and appropriating and I might add that uh, that 200000 is available inside the fund balance um, allocated for public safety. But further, should this be appropriated in FY22, then administration would propose an amendment to the FY23 budget reducing the expenditures in FY23. The transfers that occur to Fund the fund would remain intact, but the expenditures would be reduced. So we're looking at purchasing six vehicles for two hundred thousand in this fiscal cycle, and then another two hundred thousand for FY twenty three. Is that what I'm? Hearing? Have, well, it was proposed that six vehicles be purchased, but what we're trying to do is make three No. We want to purchase all six because we have we have fund money well, you still have in right. this fiscal year. But you have to do it now. That two hundred eighty thousand. Okay. Thank you. Two hundred forty thousand. I'm sorry. Madam Mayor. Yes, Mr. Brown. Which is a quick, uh, I guess it's kind of a question, but I'm assuming um, the old sedans that was used by police, the amount of equipment and emergency supplies required by officers now um, I don't believe fits what's being required now and, and Tahoe is a much better package for all the things required for officers to carry now. The uh, Councilor Brown through the mayor, the Tahoe has turned out, the police package Tahoe has turned out to be a really uh, quality vehicle. It's stoutly made. Uh, it can handle all of the technology that we're putting into the vehicles now because we have not only do we have uh, video systems, but we have three separate cameras and audio that records in the vehicle. And then we have uh, cradle point connections which allow our mobile data systems to download and have that constant connectivity. And we need to be able to place that technology in the vehicle without impeding the view and observation of the officer that's operating the vehicle. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, the, the Tahoe's have really come around. It, for a while it was the Explorers, and before that we, you know, we had Crown Victorias. It's just as uh, technology evolves and the automakers evolve with their police package, and that's specifically what we look at, because these are pursuit rated vehicles. Um, and then we just live in a climate where having that higher um, clearance is much better for us. And given this past snowfall this year, um, it, it, it proves to be a real benefit to have that kind of vehicle. 
Thank you. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. Is there any objection? Is there any objection? Then uh, it passes. New business. Okay, we are on. We're now at communications. Madam Clerk, please read the title of the item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We just have two items under communications. It's the Park and Rec Commission meeting minutes of March 9th and the Planning Commission meeting minutes of March 22nd, 2022. Thank you. We are on to audience comments. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the City Council at this time? <laughs> Can't get nobody to move, so. We're now at Mayor, Clerk, Attorney, and Council Comments. Please keep your closing remarks limited to three minutes. Madam Clerk. Thank you. Uh, council members, and again, I apologize for my voice. Um, lobbying trip to Juneau was canceled this spring. I guess apparently there was an outbreak of COVID-19 in, in the Capitol buildings, which affected that trip. To my knowledge, it's not going to be rescheduled. But if I hear uh, that it is, I'll certainly let Council Members Vlock and Brown know. Um, special budget meetings. Did you see my email? So we have special budget meetings this week on Wednesday and Thursday. On Thursday night, if you would please be here at 5.30, we actually have two special meetings that night. So at 5.30, you guys will be looking at approving an AM um, for a public works project. And then following that at 6 o'clock, we'll continue with our Committee of the Whole um, budget presentations. I did hand out a budget memo, I emailed it and then handed out the hard copy. I don't go to the budget process with it was the budget amendment forms. So if you have any questions at all, please let me know. And then also hand it out there with your stack of papers tonight is when we start doing budget presentations on Wednesday, I have both paper packet page numbers and electronic page numbers. Um, that'll maybe help you if you want to review those in advance. If you need any divider tabs, if you need any type of office supplies um, that will help you to be more organized with the budget, let me know. I'm happy to provide those. So thank you. That's all I have, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Madam Attorney. No comment, Madam Mayor. Council Member Graham. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, my, my first question would be a, a follow-up on the email uh, or the press release, I think, that you sent out regarding the dog attack. Uh, that was within the city limits. Can you update us on that? Are those dogs roaming free? Or are they uh, being restrained somehow? No, he restrained them when it all came down. Anyway, Danielle. Uh, yes, Councilmember Brown, Mayor Lickford. The dogs were contained on the day that it happened. It, this is a report that was made to us after the fact and code compliance is. Um, conducting an investigation to follow up um, with the owner of the dogs at this time. But according to the, the footage that we saw, the, the dogs were contained after the incident. And they remain contained or are they? They are not in this community. They remain under the control of their owner. So far as we are aware at this time, again, we are, we are working to follow up on the investigation with the owner. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And as long as you got your mic turned on, uh, <laughs> could you, uh, at our next uh, regular meeting, could you provide us with a, a paving schedule uh, for roads in the city of Wasilla at the next meeting? It would be nice to know that this time of year I'm getting lots of questions from folks about when's my road going to be paved and uh, you know when are we going to fix potholes and so on and so forth. And while I'm happy to refer them to your office, it would be nice to have a little bit of background information on that. I appreciate that. And then the uh, uh, last thing I wanted to follow up on uh, uh, something that uh, uh, was brought up at the last uh, regular city council meeting, the expiration dates on uh, the COVID uh, test kits. Uh, I erroneously said they were extended for 90 days. Uh, that is incorrect. They were extended for 120 days. So it's a four-month expiration uh, from the printed expiration on the back uh, of the COVID test kits. And it's my understanding, and uh, perhaps the mayor... I uh, can uh, follow up on this in her comments that, that we still have uh, 
I won't say a plethora of test kits left, but we still have a lot of test kits left. So uh, don't be shy about asking for one uh, just because, you know, uh, what we think is the worst part of the pandemic is over. You know, there's always going to be new waves, you know, for the next uh, year or two, and there's certainly one uh, headed our way. Uh, so if persons listening don't have those test kits or if uh, council members don't have a bag of those test kits, I would suggest that you uh, get with Troy or perhaps Scott might uh, have those at the Menard Center and, and uh, have some of those uh, available for your neighbors. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you all. Council Member Brown. No comments, Mayor. Council Member Sullivan Leonard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to commend Troy on the uh, budget presentation. You do a good job every year. and. Um, my time new at council again uh, things haven't changed too much we still do a really great job on that so appreciate that and appreciate the discussion that will be coming up regarding uh, departments and our overall budget so that's it for now thank you madam mayor thank you. council member Belock. no comments madam mayor. council member johnson yes madam mayor um, Long, I had asked last time if we could have a quick report as to what we're doing with speeding and speeding tickets as to how many we issued, if any, and what your thoughts are in terms of speed enforcement. Councilmember Johnson to Mayor Ledford. I um, did some research on self-initiated traffic stops, which is what officer sees a uh, probable cause to initiate a traffic stop. And I did from January 1st until March 31st of this year. Uh, total, total calls that began as self-initiated traffic stops were 957 in that three month time period. The total traffic stops that resulted in uh, case number being pulled, which means either a citation was issued or some other offense was developed during the course of that contact and there was a police report written. 213 out of those 957. Calls that resulted in a uh, drugs offense was one, uh, DUI, driving under the influence, 13, 18 warrant arrests. We had two traffic pursuits, one of which that also had a warrant arrest tied to it. Of the 109, 29 traffic stops that resulted in traffic or minor offense citation, 42 of those had multiple citations. Um, and some of those also included warrant arrests, DUIs, traffic pursuits. We had 57 proof of insurance tickets written. That's 33%. Uh, 30 speeding tickets were issued. Five were for 20 plus over the speed limit, and one was actually for racing. Uh, 22 license infractions. That includes uh, driving without a driver's license, driving in violation of a provisional license, driving while your license is suspended, uh, driving without carrying, presenting your license, uh, driving on an expired license. There were 20 failure to obey traffic control devices, which is running a stop sign, uh, red light, not making a turn as directed by the arrow, uh, those kind of violations. 20 expired registrations, 14 vehicle citations uh, relating to lighting, headlights, taillights, stoplights. Three failure to register a vehicle, three safety restraint citations, and one of which was an improper exchange restrained child, uh, two tent tickets, two windshield tickets, uh, two improper turn positions, and one improperly towed vehicle. Thank you ever so much. I think that you have shown us that, <laughs> that you are on top of the job and that we are enforcing our traffic uh, situation. I mean, that's something that this is brand new information to me because I think there was a perception out there that we weren't. But in fact, you've just put that to rest. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Danielle, you're next. I'm sorry. <laughs> you were warned. Uh, I had asked, um, the windstorm has created a big mess, usually to the west of a lot of businesses. In particular, um, <clears throat> Uh, the building supply companies where all of the plastic wrap has gone all over everything 
like Home Depot and Lowell's. And as far as code compliance or cleanup, can we approach these businesses and ask them to clean up their mess? <laughs> Thank you. I think if, if, if you or somebody from the city was simply to call the manager of these places and say, hey, you have a mess, can you have your employees clean it up? Not as, not as far as being a threatening way, but you know, certainly I don't think any of us like to see the eyesores, including the customers going to and from their stores. You know, I mean, we're not talking about it's taking a huge amount of effort if they were to, if, for instance, Home Depot was to send two people out there with about 10 trash bags that could clean up the mess in an hour or two. You know, this is not a big deal. <laughs> but it just, right now, is a really bad eyesore. Thank you. No further comments, Mayor. Okay. Council Member Rubio. I have no comments. Well, it's nice to have you sitting here tonight. Yes, I'm, I feel honored, honestly. That's <laughs> awesome. Oh, thank you. Okay, it's my turn. It has been brought to my attention that the longer serving members of this council thinks that this administration is secretive. When I was um, elected, the first thing I said was, I'm building a team, and my administration, which includes the directors, they have always put forth an effort to answer any questions that the council has asked of them. And your city clerk, if you want something in writing, she has a form for you to fill out to request whatever information it is. And if you're in City Hall, you know I'm all over this building. And uh, I sometimes go to Menard and over to WPD. So I don't know who thinks I'm being secretive, but trust me, I'm not. So, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to call. Do not hesitate to come see me. Uh, if you have, like when you get your packet, if you have questions on anything, then call the director. If you don't know who to call, call the clerk, and she'll direct you in what way you should go. So, with that, uh, is there anything else? to come before this council. Hearing not, we are adjourned at 8 o'clock.